The Snow Queen in Seven Stories by Hans Christian Andersen. Story the first, which describes looking glass and the broken fragments. You must attend to the commencement of this story, for when we get to the end, we shall know more than we do now about a very wicked hobgoblin. He was one of the very worst, for he was a real demon. One day, when he was in a merry mood, he made a looking glass which had the power of making everything good or beautiful that was reflected in it almost shrink to nothing, while everything that was worthless and bad looked increased in size and worse than ever. The most lovely landscapes appeared like boiled spinach, and the people became hideous and looked as if they stood on their heads and had no bodies. Their countenances were so distorted that no one could recognize them, and even one freckle on the face appeared to spread over the whole of the nose and mouth. The demon said this was very amusing. When a good or pious thought passed through the mind of anyone, it was misrepresented in the glass. And then how the demon laughed at his cunning, all who went to the demon's school, for he kept a school, talked everywhere of the wonders they had seen, and declared that people could now, for the first time, see what the world and mankind were really like. They carried the glass about everywhere, till at last there was not a land nor a people who had not been looked at through this distorted mirror. They wanted even to fly with it up to heaven to see the angels, but the higher they flew, the more slippery the glass became, and they could scarcely hold it, till at last it slipped from their hands, fell to the earth, and was broken into millions of pieces. But now the looking glass caused more unhappiness than ever, for some of the fragments were not so large as a grain of sand, and they flew about the world into every country. When one of these tiny atoms flew into a person's eye, it stuck there, unknown to him, and from that moment he saw everything through a distorted medium or could see only the worst side of what he looked at. For even the smallest fragment retained the same power which had belonged to the whole mirror. Some few persons even got a fragment of the looking glass in their hearts, and this was very terrible, for their hearts became cold like a lump of ice. A few of the pieces were so large that they could be used as window panes. It would have been a sad thing to look at our friends through them. Other pieces were made into spectacles. This was dreadful for those who them, for they could see nothing either rightly or justly. At all this, the wicked demon laughed till his sides shook. It tickled him so to see the mischief he had done. There were still a number of these little fragments of glass floating about in the air, and now you shall hear what happened with one of them. A little boy and a little girl. In a large town full of houses and people, there is not room for everybody to have even a little garden. Therefore, they are obliged to be satisfied with a few flowers and flower pots. In one of these large towns lived two poor children who had a garden something larger and better than a few flower pots. They were not brother and sister, but they loved each other almost as much as they had been. Their parents lived opposite to each other in two garrets, where the roofs of neighboring houses projected out towards each other, and the water pipe ran between them. In each house was a little window, so that anyone could step across the gutter from one window to the other. A 
The parents of these children had each a large wooden box in which they cultivated kitchen herbs for their own use, and a little rose bush in each box which grew splendidly. Now, after a while, the parents decided to place these two boxes across the water pipe so that they reached from one window to the other and looked like two banks of flowers. Sweet peas drooped over the boxes and the rose bushes shot forth long branches which were trained round the windows and clustered together, almost like a triumphal arch of leaves and flowers. The boxes were very high and the children knew they must not climb upon them without permission, but they were often, however, allowed to step out together and sit upon their little stools under the rose bushes or play quietly. In winter, all this pleasure came to an end, for the windows were sometimes quite frozen over, but then they would warm copper pennies on the stove and hold the warm pennies against the frozen pane there would be very soon a little round hole through which they could peep, and the soft, bright eyes of the little boy and girl would beam through the hole at each window as they looked at each other. Their names were Kai and Gerda. In summer they could be together with one jump from the window, but in winter they had to go up and down the long staircase and out through the snow before they could meet. See, there are the white bees swarming, said Kai's old grandmother one day when it was snowing. Have they a queen bee? asked the little boy, for he knew that the real bees had a queen. To be sure they have, said the grandmother. She is flying there where the swarm is thickest. She is the largest of them all and never remains on the earth but flies up to the dark cloud. Often at midnight she flies through the streets of the town and looks in at the windows, then the ice freezes on the panes into wonderful shapes that look like flowers and castles. Yes, I have seen them, said both the children, and they knew it must be true. Can the Snow Queen come in here? asked the little girl. Only let her come, said the boy. I'll set her on the stove and then she'll melt. Then the grandmother smoothed his hair and told him some more tales. One evening, when little Kai was going to bed, he climbed on a chair by the window and peeped out through the little hole. A few flakes of snow were falling, and one of them, rather larger than the rest, alighted on the edge of one of the flower boxes. This snowflake grew larger and larger, till at last it became the figure of a woman, dressed in garments of white gauze which looked like millions of starry snowflakes linked together. She was fair and beautiful, but made of ice, shining and glittering ice. Still, she was alive and her eyes sparkled like bright stars, but there was neither peace nor rest in their glance. She nodded towards the window and waved her hand. The little boy was frightened and sprang from the chair. At the same moment, it seemed as if a large bird flew by the window. On the following day, there was a clear frost, and very soon came the spring. The sun shone. The young green leaves burst forth. The swallows built their nests. Windows were opened. And the children sat once more in the garden on the roof high above all the other. How beautiful the roses blossomed this summer. The little girl had learned a hymn in which the roses were spoken of, and then she thought of their own roses. And she sang the hymn to the little boy, and he sang too. Roses bloom and cease to be, but we shall the Christ child see. Then the little ones held each other by the hand and kissed the roses and looked up at the bright sunshine and spoke to it as if the Christ child were there. Those were splendid summer days. How beautiful and fresh it was out among the rose bushes which seemed as if they would never leave off blooming. One day, 
Kai and Gerda sat looking at a book full of pictures of animals and birds, and then, just as the clock in the church tower struck twelve, Kai said, Oh, something has struck my heart, and soon after, there is something in my eye. The little girl put her arm round his neck and looked into his eye, but she could see nothing. I think it is gone, he said, but it was not gone. It was one of those bits of the looking glass, that magic mirror of which we have spoken, the ugly glass which made everything great and good appear small and ugly while all that was wicked and bad became more visible, and every little fault could be plainly seen. Poor little Kai had also received a small grain in his heart, which very quickly turned to a lump of ice. He felt no more pain, but the glass was there still. Why do you cry? said he at last. It makes you look ugly. There is nothing the matter with me now. Oh, see, he cried suddenly. That rose is worm-eaten, and this one is quite crooked. After all, they are ugly roses, just like the box in which they stand. And then he kicked the two boxes with his foot and pulled off the two roses. What are you doing? cried the little girl. And then when he saw how frightened she was, he tore off another rose and jumped through his own window, away from little Gerda. When she afterwards brought out the picture book, he said, it was only fit for babies and long clothes. And when grandmother told any stories, he would interrupt her with, but, or when he could manage it, he would get behind her chair, put on a pair of spectacles, and imitate her very cleverly to make people laugh. By and by, he began to mimic the speech and gait of persons in the street. All that was peculiar or disagreeable in a person he would imitate directly. And people said, that boy will be very clever. He has a remarkable genius. But it was the piece of glass in his eye and the coldness in his heart that made him act like this. He would even tease little Gerda, who loved him with all her heart. His games, too, were quite different. They were not so childish. One winter's day, when it snowed, he brought a burning glass, then he held out the tail of his blue coat and let the snowflakes fall upon it. Look in this glass, Gerda, said he, and she saw how every flake of snow was magnified and looked like a beautiful flower or a glittering star. Is it not clever, said Kai, and much more interesting than looking at real flowers. There is not a single fault in it, and the snowflakes are quite perfect till they begin to melt. Soon after, Kai made his appearance in large, thick gloves and with his sledge at his back. He called upstairs to Gerda. I've got to leave to go into the great square where the other boys play and ride. And away he went. In the great square... The boldest among the boys would often tie their sledges to the country people's carts and go with them a good way. This was capital. But while they were all amusing themselves and Kai with them, a great sledge came by. It was painted white, and it sat someone wrapped in a rough white fur and wearing a white cap. The sledge drove twice round the square, and Kai fastened his own little sledge to it so that when it went away, he followed with it. It went faster and faster right through the next street, and then the person who turned round and nodded pleasantly to Kai, just as if they were acquainted with each other. Then the snow began to fall so heavily that the little boy could not see a hand's breadth before him, but still they drove on. Then he suddenly loosened the cord so that the large sled might go on without him, but it was of no use. His little carriage held fast, and away they went like the wind. Then he called out loudly, but nobody heard him, while the snow beat upon him and the sledge flew onwards. Every now and then it gave a jump as if it were going over hedges and ditches. The boy was frightened 
and tried to say a prayer, but he could remember nothing but the multiplication table. The snowflakes became larger and larger till they appeared like great white chickens. All at once they sprang on one side, the great sledge stopped, and the person who had driven it rose up. The fur and the cap, which were made entirely of snow, fell off, and he saw a lady, tall and white. It was the Snow Queen. We have driven well, said she, but why do you tremble? Here, creep into my warm fur. Then she seated him beside her in the sledge, and as she wrapped the fur round him, he felt as if he were sinking into a snowdrift. Are you still cold? she asked, as she kissed him on the forehead. The kiss was colder than ice. It went quite through to his heart, which was already almost a lump of ice. He felt as if he were going to die, but only for a moment. He soon seemed quite well again, and did not notice the cold around him. My sledge, don't forget my sledge, was his first thought, and then he looked and saw that it was bound fast to one of the white chickens, which flew behind him with the sledge at its back. The Snow Queen kissed little Kai again, and by this time he had forgotten little Gerda, his grandmother, and all at home. Now you must have no more kisses, she said or I should kiss you to death. Kai looked at her and saw that she was so beautiful he could not imagine a more lovely and intelligent face. She did not now seem to be made of ice, as when he had seen her through his window, and she had nodded to him. In his eyes she was perfect, and she did not feel at all frightening. He told her he could do mental arithmetic as far as fractions, and that he knew the number of square miles and the number of inhabitants in the country, and she always smiled so that he thought he did not know enough yet. And she looked round the vast expanse as she flew higher and higher with him upon a black cloud, while the storm blew and howled as if it were singing old songs. Then away they flew over the forests and lakes, over sea and land, Around them whistled the cold wind, the wolves howled, and the snow hissed. Over them flew the black shrieking crows, but high up the moon shone large and bright, and thus Kai passed the long, long winter night. During the day, he slept at the Snow Queen's feet. The Old Woman and Her Magic Garden but what happened to little Gerda when Kai did not come back? What had become of him? Nobody knew. The other boys told how they had seen him fasten his sled to a large one which had driven out of the town gate. Gerda cried a great deal. The winter was long and dark to her. Then the spring came, and with it the warm sunshine. I will go and look for Kai said Gerda. So she went down to the river and climbed into a little boat that lay on the bank. Presently the stream began to carry it away. The boat glided along, passing trees and fields. Then Gerda saw a large cherry orchard in which stood a house with strange red, blue, and yellow windows and a straw roof. Before the door stood two wooden soldiers at attention. Gerda thought that they were alive and called to them, but naturally they did not answer. The current swept the boat straight toward the bank. Gerda called still louder, and a very old woman came out of the house. She leaned upon a crutch and wore a large sun hat painted with the most beautiful flowers. You poor child, said the old woman, and then she stepped into the water brought the boat in close with her crutch, and lifted little Gerda out. And now come and tell me who you are and how you came here, she said. 
and taking Gerda's hand, she led her into the house and shut the door. The windows were very high and painted red, blue, and yellow so that the light came through in strange colors. On the table was a bowl of the most delicious cherries, and the old woman let Gerda eat as many as she liked while she combed her hair with a gold comb. The beautiful sunny hair rippled and shone around the friendly face. I have always longed to have a dear little girl like you, said the old woman. You shall see how happy we will be together. And as she combed Gerda's hair, Gerda thought less and less about Kai, for the old woman was a witch, but not a wicked witch. She only enchanted now and then to amuse herself. She did want to keep little Gerda very much, and so she went into the garden and waved her crooked stick over all the rose bushes, and they disappeared into the black earth, leaving no trace of where they had been. The witch was afraid that if Gerda saw the roses, they would remind her of her own roses and of Kai, and she would run away. Then she led Gerda out into the garden, how glorious it was, and what lovely scents filled the air. Gerda jumped for joy and played in the garden till the sun set behind the tall cherry trees. Then she went to sleep in a beautiful bed with red silk pillows filled with violets, and she slept soundly and dreamed as a queen does. The next day, she played again among the flowers in the warm sunshine, and so many days passed by. Gerda knew every flower, but although there were so many, it seemed to her as if one was missing, but she could not remember which. One day, she happened to look at the old woman's sun hat, the one with painted flowers on it, and there she saw a rose. The good witch had forgotten about that one when she made the other roses disappear into the black earth. It is so difficult to think of everything. There are no roses here, cried Gerda. And then she sat down and cried, but her tears fell on the spot where a rose bush had sunk. And when her warm tears watered the earth, the bush came up in full bloom, just as it had been before. Gerda kissed the roses and thought of the lovely ones at home, and with them came the thought of Kai. Oh, what have I been doing? said the little girl. I wanted to look for Kai. She ran to the end of the garden. The gate was shut, but she pushed against the rusty lock so that it swung open, then ran barefoot out of the garden. No one came after her. At last... She could not run away any longer, and she sat down on a large stone. When she looked around, she saw that summer was over. It was late autumn. The seasons had never changed in the old woman's beautiful garden, where there were sunshine and flowers all the year round. My goodness, how much time I've wasted, said Gerda. It's almost winter. I cannot rest any longer. And she sprang up to run on. Oh, how tired and sore her little feet were. And all around her, it became colder and colder. The Prince and the Princess After a while, Gerda had to rest again. While she was sitting, she looked up, and there on the snow in front of her, was a large crow. It had been looking at her for some time, and it nodded its head and said, Caw! Caw! Good day. Then it asked the little girl where she was going all alone like that in the world. Gerda told the crow her story and asked if he had seen Kai. The crow nodded very thoughtfully and said, It might be. It might be. What? Do you think you have? cried the little girl, and she smothered him with her kisses. Gently, gently, said the crow. 
It might be little Kai, but now he has forgotten you for the princess. Does he live with a princess? asked Gerda. Then the crow told her everything he knew. In the kingdom in which we are now sitting lives a princess who is dreadfully clever. She has read all the newspapers in the world and then forgotten them again. She is as clever as that. The other day she was sitting on the throne, and that is not such fun as people think. Then she began to say, why should I not marry? But she wanted a husband who knew how to answer when spoken to, not one who would stand up, stiffly looking superior. That would be too boring. Caw! When she told all the ladies of the court, they were delighted. You can believe every word I say, continued the crow. I have a tame sweetheart in the palace, and she tells me everything. Of course, his sweetheart was a crow. Every newspaper came out next morning with a border of hearts and the princess initials, and inside you could read that every handsome young man might come into the palace and speak to the princess, and whoever spoke best should become her husband. Indeed, said the crow, you can certainly believe me. It is as true as that I'm sitting here. Young men arrived in streams, but nothing came of it on the first or the second day. The suitors were talkative enough in the streets, but once they went inside the palace gates and saw the guards in silver-braided uniforms and the footmen in gold-braided uniforms lining the stairs and the great hall all lit up, then their wits left them entirely. When they stood in front of the throne where the princess sat, they could think of nothing to say except to repeat the last word she had spoken, and she did not care to hear that again. It seemed as if they were walking in their sleep until they went out into the street again and were able to speak once more. There was a line of young men stretching from the town gate up to the castle. They were hungry and thirsty, but in the palace they did not even get a glass of water. Some of the cleverest had thought to bring slices of bread and butter with them, but they did not share with their neighbor, for they thought, if he looks hungry, the princess will not have him. Uh, but what about Kai? asked Gerda. When did he come? Was he in the crowd? Wait a bit, Ka. We are coming to him. On the third day, a little figure without horse or carriage walked jauntily up to the palace. His eyes shone as yours do. He had lovely curly hair but very shabby clothes. That was Kai. That was Kai, cried Gerda with delight. Oh, I have found him. And she clapped her hands. He had a little bundle on his back, said the crow. It must have been his sled. Possibly, said the crow. I did not see for certain. But I know from my sweetheart that when he came to the palace gate and saw the royal guards in silver and the footmen in gold on the stairs, he was not the least bit put out. He nodded to them, saying, It must be rather dull standing on the stairs. I would rather go inside. The halls were ablaze with lights. Counselors and ambassadors were walking around carrying gold trays, it was enough to make one nervous. The boy's boots creaked noisily, but he was not frightened. That must be Kai, said Gerda. I know he had new boots on. I've heard them creaking in his grandmother's room. They did creak, certainly, said the crow. And not one bit afraid, up he went to the princess, who was sitting on a large pearl, as round as a spinning wheel. All the ladies-in-waiting were standing around with their attendants and the lords-in-waiting with their attendants. It must have been dreadful, said little Gerda. And Kai did win the princess? I heard from my tame sweetheart that he was cheerful and quick-witted. He had not come to woo, he said, but to listen to the princess's wisdom. And the end of it was that they fell in love with each other. 
Oh, that must have been Kai. He was always so clever. He could do sums with fractions. Oh, won't you lead me to the palace? begged Gerda. That's easily asked, said the crow. But how are we to manage that? I must talk it over with my tame sweetheart. She may be able to advise us, but I may as well tell you that a little girl like you could never get permission to enter the palace. Oh, I will get in, said Gerda. When Kai hears that I am there, he will come out at once and fetch me. Wait for me by the fence, said the crow, and he nodded his head and flew away. It was late in the evening when he came back. Caw, caw, he cried. I am to give you her love, and here is a little roll for you. She took it out of the kitchen. There's plenty there, and you must be hungry. The guards in silver braid and the footmen in gold will not allow you to come into the palace. But don't cry. You shall get in all right. My sweetheart knows a little back staircase which leads to the bedchamber, and she knows where to find the key. Later that evening, they went into the palace garden, and when the lights were put out one by one, the crow led Gerda to a back door. Oh, how Gerda's heart beat with anxiety and longing. It seemed as if she were going to do something wrong, but she only wanted to know if it was little Kai. Yes, it must be he. She remembered so well his clever eyes, his curly hair. She could see him smiling as he did when they were at home under the rose trees. He would be so pleased to see her and to hear how they all were at home. Now they were on the stairs. A little lamp was burning, and on the landing stood the tame crow. She put her head on one side and looked at Gerda, who bowed as her grandmother had taught her. My fiancé has told me many nice things about you, my dear young lady, the crow said. Will you take the lamp while I go in front? We go this way so as to meet no one. They walked through the many beautiful rooms until they came to the bedchamber. In the middle of it were two beds shaped like lilies, one all white, in which the princess lay, and the other red, in which Gerda hoped to find Kai. She pushed aside the curtain and saw a slim brown neck. Oh, it was Kai. She called his name out loud, holding the lamp toward him. He woke up and turned his head and she saw that it was not Kai. It was only his neck that was like Kai's, but he was young and handsome. The princess sat up in her lily bed and asked who was there. Then Gerda cried and told her story and all that the crows had done. You poor child, said the prince and princess, and they praised the crows and said that they were not angry with them, but that they must not do it again. Now they should have a reward. Would you like to fly away free? The princess asked the birds. Or will you take a permanent place at court crows with what you can get in the kitchen? They both bowed and asked for a permanent appointment, for they thought of their old age. They put Gerda to bed, and she folded her hands, thinking as she fell asleep, how good people and animals are to me. The next day, she was dressed from head to foot in silk and satin. The prince and princess wanted her to stay on in the palace, but she begged for a little carriage, a horse, and a pair of shoes, so that she might go out again into the world to look for Kai. They gave her a muff, as well as some shoes. She was warmly dressed, and when she was ready, there in front of the door stood a coach of pure gold, with a coachman, footman, and outriders, all wearing fine gold crowns. The prince and princess helped her into the carriage and wished her good luck. Goodbye, goodbye, called the prince and princess, and little Gerda cried, and the crow cried. The wild crow, who was now married, drove with her for the first three miles. 
His wife could not come because she had a bad headache. When the wild crow had said goodbye, he flew up to a tree and flapped his big black wings for as long as the carriage was in sight. The Little Robber Girl They drove on and came to a dark forest, which the coat lit up like a torch as it passed through. When a band of robbers saw the carriage, they rushed out, exclaiming, Gold! It's gold! And they seized the horses, killed the coachmen, footmen, and outriders, and dragged Gerda out of the carriage. What a plump and tender morsel! I will eat her for my supper, said the old robber queen, and she drew her long knife, which glittered horribly. You shall not kill her, cried the queen's little daughter. She shall play with me. She shall give me her muff and her beautiful dress, and she shall sleep with me in my bed. The little robber girl was as big as Gerda, but she was stronger and broader, with dark hair and black eyes that looked a little sad. She threw her arms around Gerda and said, I will not let them kill you so long as you do not make me angry. Are you a princess? No, answered Gerda. I'm not. And she began to tell all that happened to her and how dearly she loved little Kai. The robber girl listened attentively, and when the tale was finished, she took Gerda to a corner of the robber's camp where she slept. Perched on rafters all around, were more than a hundred pigeons, who seemed to be asleep, but who fluttered a little when the two girls appeared. A reindeer came up and nuzzled the robber girl while she teased it by tickling it with her long, sharp knife. Gerda lay awake for some time, for she did not know whether she was going to live or die in the robber's camp. Coo, coo, said the pigeons. We have seen little Kai. A white bird carried his sled while he was sitting in the Snow Queen's sleigh. They drove over the forest as we were sitting in our nests. She breathed on our young and all died except two. Coo, coo. What are you saying up there? cried Gerda. Where was the Snow Queen going? Do you know anything at all? She was probably traveling to Lapland, where there is always ice and snow. Ask the reindeer. There is marvelous ice and snow there, said the reindeer. One can run about in the great sparkling valleys. There the Snow Queen has her summer palace, but her best palace is up by the North Pole, on one of the islands called Spitsbergen. In the morning, Gerda told the little robber girl all that the pigeons had said. She nodded. Do you know where Lapland is? She asked the reindeer. Who should know better than I, said the beast, and his eyes sparkled. I was born and bred there on the snow fields. Listen, said the robber girl to Gerda. You see that all the robbers have gone. Only my mother is left and she takes a nap in the afternoon. Then I shall do something for you. When her mother had fallen asleep, the robber girl went up to the reindeer and said, I'm going to set you free so that you can run to Lapland. But you must go quickly and carry this little girl to the Snow Queen's palace where her playmate is. You must have heard all that she told me, for she spoke loud enough. The reindeer leaped high for joy. The robber girl lifted up little Gerda and tied her family onto the reindeer. She even gave her a little pillow for a saddle. You must wear your fur boots she said, for it will be cold. But I shall keep your muff, it's such a pretty one. And I'm going to give you my mother's big fur gloves so that you won't freeze. They will come right up to your elbows. Gerda wept for joy. Don't make such faces, said the robber girl. You should look very happy now. And here are two loaves of bread and a sausage so you won't be hungry. When these were tied to the reindeer's back, the robber girl opened the door, called in all the big dogs, cut through the reindeer's halter with her sharp knife, and said to him, 
off with you now, but take good care of the little girl. And Gerda stretched out her hands with the large fur gloves toward the little robber girl and said, Goodbye. Then the reindeer flew over the ground, through the great forest, as fast as he could. The wolves howled, the ravens screamed, the sky seemed on fire. Those are my dear old northern lights, said the reindeer. Look how they glow. And he ran faster and faster still, day and night. The loaves and the sausage were eaten, and then they came to Lapland. The Lap Woman and the Finn Woman They stopped at a wretched little house. The roof almost touched the ground, and the door was so low that you had to creep in and out. There was no one in the house except an old lap woman who was cooking fish over an oil lamp. The reindeer told Gerda's whole history, but first he told his own, for that seemed to him much more important. And Gerda was so cold that she could not speak. Ah, you poor creatures, said the lap woman. You have still farther to go. You must go over a hundred miles into Finland, for there the Snow Queen lives, and every single night she burns blue flares. I will scribble a few words on a dried codfish, for I have no paper, and you must give it to the Finn woman, for she can give you better advice than I can. And when Gerda was warmed up and had had something to eat and drink, the Lap woman wrote a few lines on a dried cod, and told Gerda to take care of it. Then she tied her securely onto the reindeer's back, and away they went again. The whole night was ablaze with northern lights, and they came to Finland and knocked at the Finn woman's chimney, for it was so cold she had no door at all. Inside it was so hot that the Finn woman wore almost nothing. She drew off Gerda's fur gloves and boots and loosened her clothes. Finally, she read what was written on the codfish. She read it over three times till she knew it by heart, and then put the fish in her saucepan to cook, for she never wasted anything. Soon the reindeer told his story, and after his, little Gerda's, and the Finn woman blinked her eyes, but said nothing. You are very clever, I know, said the reindeer. Won't you give the little girl a drink so that she may have the strength of twelve men and overpower the Snow Queen? A strength of twelve men, said the Finn woman. That would not help much. It is true that little Kai is with the Snow Queen, and he likes everything there very much and thinks it is the best place in all the world. That is because he has a splinter of glass in his heart and a tiny chip of it in his eye. If these do not come out, he will never be free, and the Snow Queen will keep him in her power. But can't you give little Gerda something so that she can have power over the Snow Queen? I can give her no greater power than she already has. Don't you see how great it is? Don't you see how men and beasts help her when she wanders into the wide world with her bare feet? She is powerful already because she is a dear little innocent child. If she herself cannot conquer the Snow Queen and remove the glass splinters that are in little Kai, we cannot help her. The Snow Queen's garden begins two miles from here. You can carry the girl so far. Put her down by the large bush with red berries that stands in the snow, and you must come back here as fast as you can. Then the Finn woman lifted Gerda onto the reindeer, and away he sped. Oh, I have left my gloves and boots behind, cried Gerda. She missed them in the piercing cold, but the reindeer did not dare to stop. On he ran till he came to the bush with red berries. There he sat Gerda down and kissed her, and big tears ran down his cheeks. 
Then he ran back, leaving the poor girl without shoes or gloves in the middle of the bitter cold of Finland. She went on as fast as she could. A regiment of gigantic snowflakes came against her, but they melted even before they touched her, and she continued with fresh courage. The Snow Queen's Palace And now we must see what little Kai was doing. He was not thinking of Gerda, and never dreamed that she was standing right outside the Snow Queen's palace. The walls of the palace were built of driven snow, and the doors and windows of piercing winds. There were more than a hundred hulls in it, the largest several miles long, all made of frozen snow. The bright northern lights lit them up, and very large and empty and cold and glittering they were. In the middle of the great hall was a frozen lake, which had cracked in a thousand pieces. Here the Snow Queen used to sit when she was at home. Little Kai was almost black and blue with cold, but he never felt it, for the Snow Queen had kissed away his feelings and his heart was a lump of ice. He was sitting in the hall, pulling about some sharp, flat pieces of ice and trying to put them together into a pattern. He thought they were beautiful, but that was because of the splinter of glass in his eye. He was able to fit them into a great many shapes, but he really wanted to make them spell the word love. The Snow Queen had said, if you can spell out that word, you will be your own master. I shall give you the whole world and a new sled. But Kai could not do it. Today I must fly to warmer countries, said the Snow Queen. I must go and stir up my black kettles. This was what she called Mount Etna and Mount Vesuvius. And off she flew, leaving Kai alone in the great hall, trying to do his puzzle. He sat so still that you would have thought he was frozen. Then little Gerda stepped into the palace hall. The raging winds quieted down as if they had fallen asleep when she appeared. She caught sight of little Kai and ran to put her arms around his neck, crying, Kai, dear little Kai, I have found you at last. But Kai sat quite still. Gerda wept hot tears, which fell on his breast, and thawed his heart so that the glass splinter was dissolved. He looked at her and burst into tears. He cried so much that the splinter swam out of his eye. Then he recognized her and cried out, Gerda, dear little Gerda, where have you been so long? And where have I been? And he looked around him. How cold it is here, how huge and empty. He threw his arms around Gerda, and she laughed and wept for joy. It was such a happy time that the pieces of ice even danced around them for joy. When they grew tired, Kai and Gerda lay down, and as they slept, they melted the ice, forming the word that the Snow Queen had said Kai must spell in order to become his own master. Gerda kissed his cheeks, and they grew rosy. She kissed his eyes, and they sparkled like hers. She kissed his hands and feet, and he became warm and glowing. The Snow Queen might come home now, but they had his release. The word love stood written in the sparkling eyes. They took each other's hands and wandered out of the great palace. They talked about the grandmother and the roses in the window boxes, and wherever they went, the winds calmed down and the sun came out. When they reached the bush with red berries, there stood the reindeer waiting for them. He carried Kai and Gerda first to the Finn woman, who warmed them in her hot room and gave them advice for their journey home. Then they went to the lap woman, who gave them new clothes 
and let them borrow her sleigh until they reached the border of their own country. The reindeer ran alongside the sleigh till they came to fields fresh with the first spring green. There, he said goodbye. When they reached the forest, which was bursting into bud, there came riding out of it a young girl on a splendid horse. She was wearing a red cap and carrying pistols in her belt. It was the little robber girl who was tired of staying at home and wanted to go out into the world. She and Gerda recognized each other at once. You are a fine one, she said to Kai. I wonder if you deserve to be run after all over the world. But Gerda patted her cheeks and asked after the prince and princess. They are traveling about, said the robber girl. And the crow? asked Gerda. Oh, the crow is dead, answered the robber girl. His tame sweetheart is a widow now and hops about with a bit of black crepe on her leg. She makes a great fuss, but it's all nonsense. Now tell me what happened to you and how you found him. And Kai and Gerda told her all. What a story, said the robber girl. She shook hands with them and promised that if she ever passed through their town, she would come and see them. Then she rode on. Gerda and Kai went home hand in hand. There they found the grandmother and everything just as it had been. But when they went through the doorway, they found they were grown up. There were the roses and the window boxes. It was summer, warm, glorious.